Today, we are suffering a tragedy beyond conception. A tragedy of too many people. Wherever there is space and water and sunshine, living things cover the earth. The familiar animals reproduce themselves every year. Fine animals like these are never allowed to be crowded or hungry. Each new couple wants to have children, so families multiply. The newborn needs all the time there is. He must suck vigorously to develop his mother's supply of milk. The potential for increase of human numbers is enormous. On this model farm, if a couple like this one were to have four children, and each of these were to have four, before the couple is 80 years old, they would have 84 descendants. By then, the hometown, the farm, which supported two or six, must now somehow support 84. Drift to the city begins. If we were to play this game on a chessboard, starting with two grains of rice and doubling on each square, there would be a tablespoon on the ninth a cup on the 13th square, and long before we reach the 64th square, the results would be beyond conception. But food supplies of the world are not so easily increased. All the easily worked land and much of the difficult land is already under intense cultivation. In Japan, no space is wasted. Rice seedlings are transplanted into wet patties. A bean crop can be interplanted because this grain will be carefully harvested by hand. Yields per acre have already been greatly increased by improved machinery, fertilizer, and livestock. In America, this reaper binder replaced hand cutting and is now often replaced by huge combines.
machines are more efficient on the wide lands of the new world than on the tiny plots of the old. Sweet corn, once picked by hand, is dumped from a truck and bulldozed onto the conveyor of a freezing plant. On experimental farms, prize livestock make better use of improved pasture. Unlike people, the surface of the earth cannot be multiplied, but irrigation is the oldest of all the ways to extend farmland. A dry field becomes rich pasture. Sage-covered hills become an orchard. To feed the hungry, we now expect new harvests from the sea. Based on green plankton, food chains are already very productive and easily disrupted by man. Today, through dams and overfishing, many salmon rivers have lost their fish. These Pacific salmon, set free in this pond as minnows four years ago, now return to spawn and die. Eggs artificially fertilized from selected fish will be hatched and the fry shipped to a barren river to be let go next spring. Four years from now, mature fish should return to rebuild the run. It is slow and expensive to develop more food from the sea. Even if we exploit all these ways to increase the food supply, The rate at which we add to food is far below the rate at which we multiply ourselves. Food is not equally distributed anywhere in the world. And in our lifetime, it's not going to be. Rice, wheat, and corn are the mainstay of impoverished people. In richer lands, Animals eat food grains, and people eat animal products rich in protein. Hamburgers and milkshakes. In America, we take variety of food for granted. Squash, tomatoes, blackberries, string beans, grapes for wine, and hops for flavoring beer. The quality of this historic crop depends on cutting the vines quickly and rushing them to the oast house where the pods are stripped before they can wilt. Such crops are luxuries only possible where there is land to spare from raising the bare necessities of life. In the United States, we are aware that the quality of life is threatened. We do not know the effect of such crowding upon children and young people. We do not know how many is too many, how close is too close. But peace and reasonable elbow room are deeply related. In this classroom, children can study and get along together. If we double the numbers, as we have in many schools, then triple them, as we are now doing, they will argue and fight. In these situations, people begin to feel like this.
only a hundred years ago, we were a new people crossing a lonely land. Now only the mountains are empty. Each year, thousands of acres are lost to industrial plants, highways, and parking lots. We should protect rich valleys like this for raising food. Instead, a factory moves in, land values go up, high taxes force the farmer to sell. In the race for wages and profits, the nourishing land is destroyed. Each year, cities spread. Cherished patterns of living are crowded away. Next year, or the year after, this lake and its blueberries will be gone. Americans love to challenge their environment. They love to jump. To glide. We also love to attack it. Now we can pollute it altogether not only city and town, but even the countryside. Throughout history, man has hunted all species of animals, but he has never been hunted for food by any of them. Instead, his numbers have been kept down by hunger and disease. Now, grain is being shipped to many parts of the world where human numbers outrun food supplies. Without solving the problem, American surplus is being exhausted. Any delay means famine. Beside famine, stalks battle and death. But what are we supposed to do about it? Personal liberties are involved. Perhaps parents have a right to have children, or perhaps children have a right not to be born unwanted. Of course, the world has known hunger and famine before. But never like this. Before 1850, total human numbers had never exceeded one billion people. We passed two billion in 1930. We passed four billion in 1970. At the end of the present century, our current rates of growth imply a population of eight billion people. This is seven billion more than we had in 1850. For many countries, this would mean disaster on a scale beyond conception. What caused such explosive growth of population? Due to the efforts of science and medicine, adults live longer, infant deaths fall, the world fills up. Once man had to accept a high birth rate and a high death rate. Now we are experiencing a high birth rate and a low death rate. The world's population increases rapidly. 
To balance the flow of births and deaths, births must fall drastically. Many scientists and statesmen are certain that the two-child family must become the pattern for everyone. The two-child family means that parents and children would be in balance, as well as people and food. Yet the two-child family is a sad thought. Many of us must have fewer children than we want, because in the past, so many had too many. We do not like to admit this in America. In the last two centuries in the United States, the average number of children has dropped from eight to three. Yet between 1950 and 1967, with an average of three child families, we have just added 50 million more Americans, or one quarter of our entire population in 17 years. To make a dent on 50 million, how many Americans must we hurl into space to other planets? Numbers like this are hard to grasp. For comparison, 20 million died in the greatest loss of life in history, the influenza pandemic of 1918. New York, our largest city, reached 8 million in 1960. If nothing is done to limit births, death will restore the balance. There will be new wars, new famine, new disease. So long as we are not overcrowded, not hungry, not impoverished, we can pretend there is no crisis in America, that it is not our problem. Or we can recognize it is our problem and explore the means to fewer births. For millions of years, human existence has depended on the success of fertilization. A woman is designed to get pregnant, and a man is designed to get her that way. But now, human existence may very well depend on circumventing this design. Conception can be prevented by social control. Society can delay and prevent sexual relations by separation of boys and girls, by strict chaperonage of the unmarried. By later marriage, the Irish marry eight years later than Americans. In Tibet, formal celibacy was encouraged in monasteries and nunneries. These methods of birth control may seem rigorous, yet they have been effective in slowing population growth and have been enforced by many religions and races of people. Today, in addition to social controls, Modern contraception prevents pregnancy, even though sexual relations take place. Most methods are used by the woman to prevent fertilization of an egg. In human fertilization, sperm are placed by the male in the vagina. Sperm enter the cervix very quickly, pass through the uterus, and fertilize the egg in the tube. The fertilized egg may implant in the wall of the uterus, or it may disappear. Turning to the side view of the woman and starting at the top are the ovary and tube. The uterus, where pregnancy occurs, projects into the elastic vagina, which opens out just under the pubic bone. 
These are widely used methods of contraception. The two most effective are the IUD and the pills. These methods are preferred because women using them are protected at all times. Other methods are less effective, partly because couples neglect to use them. The pills were the result of expensive research and must be bought regularly. The IUD costs a few cents to make and, if suited to the woman, provides protection for years. The intrauterine device, or IUD, fits the uterine cavity. It is often made of flexible plastic. The strings make it easy to remove. Using sterile gloves, it is fed into a plastic tube, fitted with a plunger, and inserted through the cervix into the uterus. On this x-ray, the IUD uncoils into place in the uterus. The strings can be seen at the cervix. The IUD affects only the tubes and the uterus. The surface it touches is shed every month. New IUDs are being perfected for women who have not had children. The pills are hormones and must be taken and taken correctly to be effective in preventing pregnancy. They are started on the fifth day and taken daily for 20 days. The first day of the new flow is new day one. Pills are restarted on new day five. Many women cannot remember this. Others complain of side effects. Future research promises injections of hormone instead of pills. Pills are fine for spacing births, but the IUD is preferred for the completed family. Other widely used methods depend on preventing the sperm from entering the uterus. This is very difficult to do. The foam makes an effective barrier and stops the motion of the sperm. A full applicator is inserted in the back of the vagina just before intercourse and again each time intercourse is repeated. The diaphragm is rarely requested when other modern methods are available. It is inserted into the vagina to make a barrier at the cervix and must be used with a sperm killing jelly or cream. The rhythm method depends on avoiding intercourse during that part of the month when the egg is likely to be shed. For women with regular periods, this occurs sometime between the 10th and the 23rd day. In this interval, couples must avoid intercourse because the time of ovulation and the days of sperm survival are not known. For women with irregular periods, this method is no help at all. The male, in hopes of preventing pregnancy, sometimes attempts to withdraw before any sperm are shed. To be effective, this method requires great control. For many couples, it results in pregnancy. Condoms and foams are important methods because they can be bought without prescription. The condom or rubber is highly effective if the male uses it each time and uses it correctly. Space must be left at the tip and the rim of the condom must be held in place during withdrawal to prevent the sperm from spilling. Over the long term, sterilization may be the best answer. For the male, vasectomy can be done in an office or clinic and is a simpler procedure than sterilizing the woman. Vasectomy cuts and ties off the sperm-carrying tube, or vas, but leaves the male hormone cells intact. 
Sex drive and performance are not affected because hormones enter the bloodstream just the same. For the woman, sterilization is a hospital procedure. Cutting and tying her tubes keeps an egg from reaching the uterus. Often performed after the last birth, it is effective and quite safe. Abortion is the commonest method of birth control in the world today. In America, one out of five pregnancies ends in abortion. Almost all of these are illegal. In other countries where it is legal, a suction tube is being widely used to detach the embryo quickly and safely. With medical care, abortion can be safer than childbirth. Beyond the moment of conception, what then? Imperceptibly, over a period of weeks, new life begins. The embryo is about two weeks old when the first period is missed. This human embryo is about six weeks old. It will be three or four months old before the mother shows much change of shape. Pregnancy ordinarily ends with the experience of childbirth. where muscular action of the womb propels the baby through the ring of the pelvis and out into the world. A healthy woman is exhilarated by successful childbirth and in most societies enjoys feeding her baby through the first months of life. Today, the world has room only for the child you do want. The child needs a mother's love, a father's example. But what about the unwanted child? What does a boy think of when he has sired a baby he does not want? Who will he talk to? How much will it cost? What will happen to her? What does a girl think of when she must choose between abortion and giving away her baby? Teenagers are producing more thousands of babies for adoption every year or are rushing into early marriage where divorce rates are twice the national average. Grandparents, hoping to retire, are suddenly raising these babies. Thus, attitudes are changing. Once it was a sin to vaccinate against smallpox, to protect against polio. Today, we believe citizens should protect society and themselves from these disasters. Unwanted pregnancy is also a cruel disaster, and couples should protect themselves. If contraception is one answer, it must be much easier to get for the single, for the young, for the poor. It is still true that the rich get richer and the poor get babies. By 1965, in New York City, for the first time, the number of babies born to welfare parents approached the number born to wage earners. This imbalance threatens rich and poor alike with the breakdown of civic life. 
Can we balance population and resources at this late date? Human resistance to birth control comes partly from a desire to outbreed or a fear of being outbred by some other group of some other race, religion, or language. Only the two-child family silences these fears and is fair to everyone. But the two-child family will not become a fact unless all peoples, all religions everywhere, limit their populations. Traditionally, population was held in check by late marriage, disapproval of sex, and infant death. The facts of contemporary life are early marriage, approval of sex, and infant survival. This has caused an emergency which has not fully struck home to us. For any population, an age profile graph like this pictures the ratio of young to old. A sequence of graphs shows change of population size through time. A town in America 150 years ago might have had many deaths in the first few months of life, steady dying off in the middle years, and few people surviving past 50. The difference between this population and this much larger one is not more births. It is survival of babies into adult years. Such a shift occurred suddenly in many countries due to modern control of disease. If a two-child family were the pattern, this population would stabilize here. But larger families are still the pattern. Births increase, the base from which population grows expands again. This expanding pavilion of people threatens the limited green fields of the earth. Can we halt this expansion? Only if we limit ourselves, not only now, but generation after generation. It is a race between births and birth control. It is a race against famine and disease and war and death. But if we are in love, what we do is our own affair. Our own affair. Our, our own, own affair. But today, babies are the world's affair.